17. And the word says, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Through seeing, they do not see. Through hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For the people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I will heal them. But blessed are your eyes, they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Great job. Good singing today. You guys sound really good. So that's, that's exciting to be able to be here and to be able to hear all these things and see all those things. I am so unused to preaching that I forgot the remote. <laughs> so I know it's been two whole weeks and uh, you forget how to do it. Well, hopefully not that much. Uh, it is an exciting time, though. We've had lots of things going on in the past, and we have even more coming up. In case you don't know when the 18th is, it's Saturday. And so by this Saturday, we need to have people to help with the turkey pantry. And so there's 100 turkey dinners that we're giving away to the neighborhood, and it just takes a little bit of organization to be able to pass all those out. And so there are sign-up sheets, and that's what we really need is so that we're more organized and know exactly what's going on. So if you guys can help us, that would be a great thing. Actually, we're helping you. It's all of us working and doing all this together. And next week also, we're going to do things a little bit different. I'm going to have Joel and Joshua speaking as well. So all three of us are going to be preaching. So bring a pillow. <laughs> no, it's not that bad. <laughs> We're going to cut it down some so that uh, it should be a really exciting time to be able to talk about God and talk about what we're thankful for. So, good things going on. Did you ever not get a joke? <laughs> Happens all the time, doesn't it? It just is one of those things. Um, let me. This was my son's favorite joke that he came up with. So let me go to the guy who will understand this. <laughs> so, one of my own. <laughs> ask me if I'm a truck. Are you a truck? No. Excellent. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> it was the dumbest thing, but everybody always laughed. I, I, you know, that was his joke. It's, it's as good as any knock-knock joke you've ever heard. That's just the way it is. But sometimes we feel like we're, we're not involved. We don't get it. We don't really quite understand what's going on. And, and I think it's that way with God a lot. That there are times when we just don't understand exactly the way things are working. And so uh, we want to talk a little bit about that today. And I think there's a lot of things in life where we don't understand that. We just don't get it. Some people seem to have a, a great marriage and great kids and everything goes great with them. And they're so happy. And then... Why isn't ours that way? Well, maybe we married the wrong woman, right? Or she married the wrong guy. And so, well, we'll fix that. We'll get a different one. And sure enough, it's the same problem. After four or five times, you might figure out it's you. But it isn't the four or five times. It's that we don't understand how it works. And maybe if you understand a little bit better about how it works... Anybody can have a good relationship, and that's really what it's about, but you have to understand a few things and be able to do it God's way, and so it's one of those things that we feel like we're missing sometimes, and a lot of the world is missing, because you just look at the divorce rate. What does it take to be a good worker? Well, some people don't know how to do that, 
They really don't quite understand that I have to be able to do some things in order to even be a good worker. What does it take to be financially secure, at least be able to pay bills? Well, you know, there are some things you have to learn in order to do that. And so it's not just a matter of saying, well, I can spend whatever I want, and then I go, well, somebody's got to help me. No, maybe you need to plan ahead a little bit. And there are some of those things that we just don't understand, and the Bible's the same way, and Jesus is very much like that when he begins to speak. And so the passage that Brandon read to us is about parables. Jesus has just told them the parable of the sower. And in Matthew 13, you have a whole lot of parables that are collected there. And the disciples are saying, you know what? We don't understand. Why are you talking in parables? Why is it that you're saying things that are a little bit more difficult to understand? And so that's one of the things that they're trying to get across and they're trying to ask. He says, you speak in parables. And I think the reason he does that is they may understand the story but they may struggle with the meaning. And so they're not quite going to get the whole thing. And so he says, seeing, you don't really see it. And hearing, you don't really hear it. I mean, you heard the words, but you don't get the joke. You don't get what's going on with life. You don't know how to make it work for yourself. And I think we find ourselves a lot of times that way. Also, with the parables of Jesus, you also know, especially as he quotes the passage here from Isaiah, that that was a long time in the future. They're living in the middle of a very bad time in Israel. The king is wicked, the people are wicked, and Isaiah is trying to prophesy about this, and he's trying to, you know, get the people to understand what it means, and, and they're just not getting it. And so that's really what Isaiah speaks to, is the fact that you're not going to get it, you're not going to see, you're not going to understand. And that particular passage in Isaiah 6 it's where Isaiah is sent out. He says, I want you to go out and tell people. And they're not going to get it. So what is it we can do so that they will get it? That's what we really want to talk about today. And so as you look at what he's talking about in the parable, I'm just going to run through it real quick. The sower goes out and he sows some seed on the road. And it says, the birds came and ate it. And it was just taken away. And so for some people, the word of God is told to them but they just don't get it. It's like sitting in a math class. I mean, it just does not make any sense whatsoever. You know, why are we adding A's? I thought we used numbers here. And, you know, I told that to my son one time, and he said, I haven't used numbers in years. He's also a math professor, and he, he said, we don't use numbers to do math. What, are you crazy? I'm like, there's something wrong with this picture. But that's the way it works. And so some people have heard it, but it's gone immediately. It never sunk in. And if, you know, if they said something the next few minutes, you wouldn't even know what it was. It's just gone. And then he talks about people who have rocks. Some seed is sown among the, the rocks. And that's people who uh, have hard things in their life. And some people seem to have real difficulties all the time. And there's a lot of things that become so hard for them. And maybe it's losing a job, and maybe it's marriage, and maybe it's your kids, and maybe it's just a disease or something like that that's going on, and maybe it's your health. And so it's all of those things that become very difficult so that it's really hard to hear what God's trying to say. And you're trying to deal with so many of these other things that we don't see God as really helpful for what I'm trying to deal with right now. And how can a, God, a good God let people suffer and not fix it? And that's always the next question that comes up. And so it's why we have a desert. They die out from lack of nourishment. And then the next one is about thorns, and that means we have too much. Everything grows, not only the good seed, but every weed and every single thorn and thistle and everything grows. And so it's all just choked out. And it all grows well. Everything you touch is a success. Your marriage is great. Your kids are great. Your job is great. Your sports team is great. Everything is going well for you. And you've got all these opportunities to be able to go on vacation, to be able to take recreation, be able to do everything. And everybody wants you to be able to go with them. 
And then how can you have any time for God? And so you might have heard it, but there's so much other stuff going on, I just can't fit him in. And so we don't hear for that reason. And then he talks about the good, so the good soil and that we're open to God and whatever he wants to plant in our life and we don't let too many things in and we deal with the hard things so that life is not overrun by all the difficulties but somehow we've managed to deal with those. And I think Jesus had an especially difficult time because when he comes and he's the Messiah and they've been looking for the Messiah and waiting for the Messiah and he gets there and... Uh, they don't like him. How can you not like him? He's a very nice guy. Yeah, but he's not what we're looking for. We always define everything in terms of where we are. And so they were looking for someone who was going to come and who would destroy the Roman control. The Romans had come in and captured their country and they had to pay taxes and tithes to Caesar and they say, well, you know, if we had a Messiah, he would lead us out of that and we wouldn't have to pay taxes to Caesar. And they just don't get it. They believe the Messiah would fix everything. And that's generally our misconception about God is we believe God will fix everything. Some people believed and later came to understand. And I hope you see the order of that. Sometimes we believe and later come to understand. And sometimes you say, I have to understand first before I can believe anything. Well, you're going to have a hard time believing very much then. It's going to be difficult to do that. Peter tries to stop him from dying. You know, No, you're not going to go to a cross. You can't possibly do that. Well, none of us would have any hope of eternal life if he actually had done that. So a lot of times people look and they don't really see Jesus. They don't see what's real. They see religion. And you begin to look at what religion is. Well, you know about church. It's the place where you go get shot. That's the news lately. It's a place of real violence. And it's not just now, it's been that way for a long time because when you start to think about wars and about the problems that people have and what goes on, a lot of times wars start because of some sort of religious issue. And if wars come from religion, then we shouldn't have religion. And that's really the way that they begin to look at it. Bombing in the name of God. Yeah, goes on in our world. And then preachers aren't really good either. I don't know if you've seen that or not, but a lot of times it's always in the, in the news. They're asking for money, and then you're finding out how they misspent it. That's really what we think about them. And they, you know, live way above their congregation. They, I'm waiting for that money to come in, by the way. <laughs> and then they find out that he's human, and that he actually sins, and that's worse than anything else. I mean, how can you have a preacher who ever sins? How can you have one who doesn't? I mean, you really need to understand that part first. And then he wants forgiveness, and, you know, who can do that? After all, he was the preacher. Or you take Christians and you find that they're hypocrites. We choose the worst one. There's somebody in a church somewhere who's embezzled funds and now lives in Tahiti or somewhere like that. Or there's a sex scandal that goes on with the church. And so you see all the worst, and you say, yeah, that's what churches are like. And we categorize them all as being that way, as they don't live what they preach. And church is just there to help people. That's all they do. Jesus didn't really pass out money. And so if church doesn't give me everything I need, then, well, I can't believe in that church because they obviously can't be right. And even seeing God as a father, sometimes they just don't get that because their, God, their father wasn't all that good. And in our world today, we have the biological father, the stepfather, and the... Uh, absent father but it's pretty hard to find a really good father 
One who would take care of us. One who would provide for us. One who would be there all the time. And so people look at where we are. And they go, we don't get it. And the reason I'm telling you all that is so that when we go out and we talk to people, they may not get it. You may say, come to church. It's, it's a great place. We have all kinds of things that go on. We help lots of people. And they go, yeah, I know about you guys. Because of somebody else somewhere who did something wrong. And you just can't win. Well, what do we do with that? I think first we got to be able to see what's good for us, that we do have a father who acts like a real father and that he has commitments to us and that we become those kind of fathers and we make arrangements to keep people safe and to give them what they need. And we're all hypocrites of some time. I don't see that getting any better, except just try not to. Try to be honest in your relationships. Try to be honest with the truth and honest about what you say and about what you do. But no matter what, if you ever mistake, make a mistake, they'll point it out. And the main way that they learn how to live is by making everyone else worse than them. Have you run into people like that? You know, they always talk about somebody else and how bad they are. And this person's terrible and that person's terrible. Why would they do that? Well, by the time I get running down everybody else, I look pretty good. And maybe that's the only way they can try and justify where they are is because they look good after they've run down everybody else. It's just a terrible way to deal with things. And so we live in a world where people don't understand God. They don't understand his church. They don't understand what it's about. God has made himself known, but they really don't get it. And the reason why, this is the whole lesson. They make themselves the center of the universe. That's the key. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul writes this. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in all the things that has been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worship and they serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so he says God made himself known. It isn't as if God didn't do that. God created all of this world as an expression of who he is. Here is what goodness looks like. When goodness shows itself, every single color matches, except in my closet. I don't know how that is. But every single color matches. You don't have anything in nature that doesn't fit, that doesn't belong in shape, in form, in color, in function, in anything. And he makes all of it work together. And he says, do you understand a little bit about who I am? That I'm not a God of chaos. That I'm a God who puts everything together. And I make it beautiful. And yes, it all works. Of course it all works. And that goodness of God is revealed. His eternal power as he keeps things going. And, and it's just staggering the way that we see the universe. You know, they used to believe that the sun revolved around the earth. And I can see why. Because you watch it come up, you watch it go across, and you watch it go down. And you hope it's going to make another cycle. So it's going to circle right around me. Because sunrise is wherever I am. Midday, sunset is I'm here. And then somehow we learn that there are other places on the planet. 
And then we learn that maybe it's not the sun going around us, maybe us that's spinning and revolving around the sun. Boy, that's a hard concept for some people. What do you mean I'm not at the center of the universe? And we just don't know how to deal with that. See, the world doesn't get being a Christian. Why would anyone want to be a Christian? After all, your morality would be very different from the world, and we don't want to do that. I mean, morality is pretty loose now. You can get away with almost anything. It would mean that you have to clean up your language and watch what you say. It would mean that you have to go to church, and, you know, why would we do that? Why would we do something that makes life harder for us? Why can't we just do everything that we want to do? And so why can't I just do anything I want? Why would we allow strict rules in this age of freedom? Well, we can do anything that we want, well, until somebody decides it's not right. So they decide there's one easy fix. I'm going to disavow God. I'm going to claim that there is no God. I'm going to claim I believe in evolution, knowing that things don't get better. I've never quite understood that, the evolution that assumes everything will naturally be better. But we live that, we think that, we, we breathe that, that, you know, somehow everything gets better with no effort. Every relationship you have gets better over time with no effort. We are all tending toward natural friendship and openness and honesty with everybody because evolution says everything gets better. We don't understand why erosion works the way it does. Why isn't the earth regenerating itself if evolution works and it's survival of the fittest and it always leads to a higher form of life and everything gets better? This earth ought to be great. Goodness, it ought to be replenishing itself all the time. But that's not really the case. You see, we tend toward chaos. And relationships take hard work or they end up in chaos. And even the earth takes a little bit of work trying to preserve what it's supposed to be or it ends up with erosion and it ends up in chaos. It ends up being a very toxic place for us to live. Everything does not get better, but it's the only way we could get rid of God. So we have unbelief because we don't understand. What we don't understand is this is God's world. It isn't ours. It doesn't belong to us. We can't understand because of what we assume because we assume and want to believe there is no God, and if there is no God, then no one sets rules for me, and I can do anything I want. And God gives us up to live what, like we want. But if you've ever been loved, you know why God But that's the case. They've never been loved. They've never really seen it. And if you've never really seen it, you find it a very difficult place to be. And so it does depend on where you start. If it starts with us, if everything revolves around us, if everything is about what's right and fair to me, then the world's a very different place, isn't it? We want and we need and it's all about me and give me what I want and give me what I need. And a loving parent would... Never discipline a child, right? Because the child ought to have whatever he wants. Just let him run. Let him do whatever he wants. Let him have his free expression. It doesn't matter because it's all about me. But actually, a loving parent would discipline so that children would turn out better. They don't let them just play with dangerous, th dangerous things. They have some rules that they can't cross, and a loving God would take care of his people the same way. And say, don't destroy yourself. You see, sometimes we get angry because it isn't fixed right now. I prayed about it. God, why didn't you fix it? I need it fixed by Thursday. You know, that, I know I gave you a couple of days in there, but when God doesn't answer right away, we get upset. 
It's usually about this time when you can go to the store and you can see people shopping for Christmas and the two-year-old tantrum starts. I want it! Maybe Santa will bring it. But I want it now! And the, the child is just using his whole body expression, all of his voice, pounding his fist. I want what I want! And it seems like a lot of us at times. And we turn into that tantrum of saying, but I want this. But you're killing yourself with it. We start with us, and then we try and explain everything else in relation to us. And it's not really what happens. What if it all starts with God? What if everything goes there? What if he makes us for his pleasure? Because we assume he created the world for us, right? Let me give you a clue, he didn't. He made the world for him, for his pleasure, for what he wants. In fact, we are here for his pleasure. He made himself known by creation. His eternal power and divine nature can be absolutely seen. And he allows us to enter into his story and into his glory and there are incredible things that happen. But we've done some damage to ourselves, and so we need to be cleaned up a little bit before we get to go there. And I've already got Romans 8 up. In Romans 8, he begins to talk about what happens and about the difference between those two things that we've been discussing. He says in verse 5, he said, For those who live according to the flesh have set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, and to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, and it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So he's using a figure here to say people who just make themselves the center of the universe and plan everything around them as if they are what's most important. He says, here's what happens with them. They set their mind on themselves and they think about themselves and they are what's most important. And they're concerned about what's physical. And that's all they see. They don't consider spiritual things because they can't touch those. He says they can't please God. He says they're not able to. Part of it's because of the selfishness. They're thinking about themselves, and then they begin to demand attention from God. I'm angry, I'm afraid, I, but I'm refusing to surrender. And it's just that they completely misunderstand God. And they misunderstand this life, and they misunderstand His people, and they don't quite get it. Not trying to be as if we should blame them for anything. I'm just trying to say that a lot of times they just don't get it. They just don't understand. Because the following verse in Romans 8 and starting in verse 9, he says, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if God is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raises Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your immortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. He says you have a choice. We live according to the flesh. We live according to the spirit. The flesh looks like physical getting what I need, getting what I want. That's the only concern. And the spiritual looks like an investment in something bigger, something beyond this life, something that helps this life make sense, something that controls the chaos and organizes it, and something that says there is so much more to this life because it gets so much bigger than this. One becomes an enemy of the other. Because it absolutely does not want to submit and it can't even think that way. And sometimes they don't get it until many years later when they can actually see it. 
My assumption was always that people are good. All people are good. And good people want to know what God's about, and good people are always going to do good things, and good people you can always trust, and that we live in a world where, you know, there's a lot of good people out there. You can always trust everybody. I mean, not everybody. There's one or two. Right? Is that still your conclusion today? The guy who hacks your computer is trying to do what? What does he get out of it? Well, I can cause you a problem for a while. That's what he gets out of it. I can hurt somebody. And I don't know that I see the world that way anymore. That everybody's good and that everybody is nice and that everybody is the way that they should be. I wish I could. Don't you? I wish I could see that. That everybody is good, but it just doesn't look that way anymore. And it's easy to say it's a terrible place and they're awful and they're horrible. And what do we do with them? We ought to do something. We blame them. We ought to vote them out of office. We ought to demand that they be put in jail. We ought to... But it really comes down to the fact that they don't understand. They don't know what it's about. They don't know what it's like. They don't know how life works. They don't know how love works. They don't understand this whole world and what God is up to. It's really hard for them to see who God is. And people who are told evolution have a really hard time with creation. And if you didn't get this story until later on, I can see why. Because we tell a story about a man and a woman who were placed in a garden. It was perfect and it was beautiful and God put them there. And it was just a great place. Well, but they sinned and so they're out of the garden. And then you get the whole boat story and you're like, wait a second. So people were bad and uh, God told one guy who was still good to build a boat and he put every animal on the earth, two of every kind at least, into this boat. So when the water came for the flood, it wiped out all the wicked people and his boat floated. And you're like, right. What kind of a story is this? If you hadn't heard that for the last 20, 30, 40, 60 years, would you buy that? There was this giant boat way back, way, way, way back, you know, before telephones, before cell phones. And this guy made this great boat, and every species of animal got in. You're like, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> it's a little tall, a little bit hard to believe. And then you go to the next one and that there was a guy who took a nation out of Egypt, one of the most powerful nations, and he led them out into a desert. We live in a desert. We know what it's like to spend an afternoon in a desert. Imagine 40 years out there. And they finally went across and they went into a promised land and really, one guy? It does get to be kind of a big story to swallow, doesn't it? If you don't believe in an all-powerful God and you look at it from a physical standpoint, it does seem kind of strange. But the fact is, we know an all-powerful God. We know a God who created everything. We know a God who can part the Red Sea and let them walk across on dry land. We know a God who can take a guy who's thrown into a lion's den and make him come out okay, or a fiery furnace. We know a God who's powerful like that. We know a God who's able to do that. And so the people that misunderstand and that don't get that need someone who believes in that to say, yes, it's real. And let me show you what that kind of life looks like. Because Jesus came to live that kind of life. And they need to see a church who is not just a place where people get help, but it's the temple of God. It's a place where we worship God, and they need to see Christians who believe, even if they're not perfect. 
And they need to see people who believe beyond their understanding so that their understanding will come later and that they turn first to God. It's incredible to think that we could come to that. But it takes some work, it takes some explanation, it takes some understanding, and you're it. The way you live, the things that happen in your life as you live for God, people are going to look at you and go, how did you do that? You say, well, let me explain to you about a God who allows this kind of life. Because we stick to his principles, we follow his teaching, we do what he said, and we know that Jesus was here, and Jesus died on a cross, and Jesus made it possible. Even though the world rejects the idea of surrender coming to power, Jesus did it. And we understand that. I saw this, sometimes being understanding is more important than being right. Sometimes we need not a brilliant mind that speaks, but a patient heart that listens. Not keen eyes that always see faults, but open arms to accept. Not a finger to point out mistakes, but a gentle hand that leads. That's our place. That's what we do. In the middle of a world that seems so obsessed with itself, that it cannot quite grasp how to live without destroying itself. We're the voice of reason. Not to blame, but to say, look at a better way. Look at what it really means to be loved. Look at what it really means to have God. Look at what God really did create and how he deals with his people. Look at the fact that redemption and forgiveness is absolutely possible. And that he's made a place for us. And you have a chance to go there. It's one of those amazing things that we can have. But only if we decide first. Because our life has to be right first. And maybe you found yourself in the chaos. And so maybe your life isn't like that. And you're wondering, I'm not sure if God's really there or not. Because my life seems to end up more in chaos than in anything else. Maybe there's a difference God can make. Can we help you with that today? Because God makes sense. God puts things together. And God straightens out lives so that we can understand. If you need to come to him, come as we stand and sing.